Welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. This is a space where we seek to create and cultivate healthy conversations between those things we geek out on and the philosophical and theological questions that often arise out of our fandoms. Like, what does it mean to be human? What makes a hero? What makes a villain? How do the stories and narratives we geek out on shape how we live in the world? We are your priest to the geeks. We aren't all ordained, but we see ourselves as mediators at the intersection of geek culture and going deeper in our faith. We don't always have to agree, but we do respect each other, and we see everyone as a beloved child of God. Everyone geeks out on something, so come geek out with us and enjoy the show. You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Are you ready for an adventure with Superman? What is the three-body problem? Are you on Team Green or Team Black? What happens in the third season of Sweet Tooth? Well, guys, we're going to be asking these questions and much more on today's episode of Systematic Ecology. We are the Priest of the Geeks. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, joined by the first time I've ever had the opportunity to be with him, Andy Walsh. How's it going, Andy? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Guys, this is going to be a what's new episode, so no geeking out, no recommendations on that end. We're just going to get into this one by starting off by heading into our lightning round. And I'm going to start off with the Acolyte. I have, if you've been listening, you know I have been kind of lukewarm at best and mostly still there, although I will say episode five and episode six were steps in the right direction. Andy, have you been watching the Acolyte at all? Uh, unfortunately, I have not. I've been waiting to watch it with my family, and so we're a little bit uh, behind on some things. Uh, but I, they, they had me at Ain't Carrie Ann as a Jedi. Yes. Yeah, I think she does well with what she has. Um, I'm just, uh, as opposed to Will and John, I, I'm not big on what they're trying to say. I'm not real ha- happy about the shorter episodes with the budget they had. So whatever. That's on me. Uh, is there anything you been geeking out on recently for the lightning round kind of section yeah so i watched this uh show on apple tv uh called sugar it's a, okay. a noir story with colin farrell uh and right up until it isn't which is why i thought it would be interesting to, to bring up i don't want to spoil it uh in, in lightning okay round, but uh it, if you like things that that kind of mash up genres in an unexpected way uh and or if you like colin farrell who's very talented uh then i think I think it's worth giving it giving a shot. The episodes are only like half an hour, uh, so it goes by pretty quickly. And and it, it was interesting. And I would like someone to watch it so I could talk to them about it because it, it was just kind of like, whoa, what did I just watch? And that was Sugar. Sugar, yes, with Colin Farrell okay. um, on Apple TV. Okay. Well, next up, uh, the next portion of Mushoku Tensei: Jobless Reincarnation Season Two, Part Two came out. And if you're following along with Anazal Ministries, you know I started a podcast called Why I Don't Like, and this is the show that I'm covering. <laughs> so I am um, not happy with certain things that have happened. Then again, this show has never really made me happy. But uh, I do want to say that I don't hate the show. I don't hate anyone who likes the show. But it's kind of one of those things that just really irks me at the end of the day with certain choices that are made. And this season was no stranger to that, especially when polygamy gets thrown in. That's so much fun. Uh, Andy, anything else for your lightning round? Sure. I'll just throw in a a plug for uh, The Fall Guy, which is now out on digital uh, streaming. Uh, Not enough people saw it in the theaters, but maybe hopefully folks will watch it at home and uh, we'll get more movies in that vein. Uh, Just, you know, it's a great big love letter to stunts and stunt men and women and action filmmaking. And, uh, yeah, so if those those kinds of things are your jam, uh, it is just uh, a lot of fun. All right. Anything else for the lightning round? Are we good to go? Um, also, throw in, I'm, I'm reading a book called Fighting Without Fighting uh, as a uh, something to go along with uh, The Fall Guy. It's about uh, kung fu cinema, but also how it's impacted Hollywood action cinema in general. Uh, it's by Luke White. It's not exactly a brand new book. I think it came out last year, but it's been an interesting companion uh, as kind of getting the history and background, uh, both in the U.S. and China, on uh, the development of action cinema and martial arts cinema in particular. So if you like geeking out on that sort of thing, uh, it's a good read. 
I love me some good kung fu films, no matter how bad they end up being. Just just like to see some people beating up other people, you know, and there's something I really want to talk about. But I think I'll just leave it very nebulous because I don't know if that's been announced at all. So I'll just say that (laughs) and just be mysterious for the sake of being mysterious. All right. It's time to go into the proper discussion. We're done with the lightning round. My first pick for this What's New episode is the second season of My Adventures with Superman. Now, I know beforehand we had talked, you have not been watching this. Had you watched the first season at all? Uh, I've not seen the first season. I did watch a couple of the most recent episodes, uh, knowing that we would be talking about it, uh, just to kind of get the flavor and, and to get a sense of where the story was. Yeah. So for those unaware, you haven't heard us talking about it before. This is a newer uh, animated show. It's being shown on Adult Swim, which surprised me, uh, which actually enhances the fact that they're able to show a little more violence than it would have if this was shown during the day, a little more heavy subject matter, but nothing that feels like it takes away from the spirit of Superman. It's him trying to establish himself. It's a very young Superman, young Lois Lane, young Jimmy Olsen. As they're figuring out the world, as they're becoming friends, you know, Lois and Superman, you know, starting their relationship with one another. It's been a lot of really good fun. There's some changes along the way I'm not big on when it comes to, you know, how they design certain characters or how, how, what was I going to say, how certain characters are represented with their characterization. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I am a huge fan of the show. It, It is fun and there's very few things that i'm watching that are like genuinely this fun right now and i really really appreciate when people are having fun with their product so uh, what are your initial thoughts having watched some of the episodes without a lot of context yeah i i agree with a lot of what you said you know i it was clear that part of the appeal is you know sort of more of a young adult uh take on superman uh, I think that's a that's a good way to address the perennial issues of oh Superman's too powerful Superman can solve anything. Well, if you've set stories in his early days and he's still trying to figure things out, that creates opportunities for drama uh, because he might not know that how he can solve the problem even if he has the power to do so or the or the you know the the abilities to do so. Um, you know, yeah. it did seem like it was a lot of fun, um, and. Yeah, I can see where, you know, having some of the characters a lot, you know, everybody seems very young and that's kind of an interesting take on folks like Lex Luthor or uh, Deathstroke was in was in one of the episodes that I watched. And that, that was an interesting take on that character. Um, I agree completely. <laughs> but uh, but overall, yeah, you know, uh, I love a good bit of Superman and, and this seemed like a fun uh, and cool bit of Superman. So, yeah. Now, obviously, you're an X-Man guy, but like what, what is your history with Superman and comics, animation all over? Yeah, I mean, actually, Superman was probably my gateway to superheroes in general. Uh, the both the Christopher Reeve films, and mm. uh, I remember getting like big hardback uh, collections of Superman comics from the library. There must have been like fifties and sixties Superman comics that they had reprinted in black and white in these giant, you know, omnibus style kind of things. And yeah, so that was that was my first introduction to to the world of superheroes was were those two things, and you know, obviously. You know, there's very little uh, that hasn't been said about how great Christopher Reeve was as Superman uh, and how good, especially those first couple films are. Um, you know, those, those 1950s and, and 60s comics are pretty bonkers. Uh, some of the some of the story ideas, uh, some of the, the goofy powers that they give <laughs> Superman. But, you know, as, as a eight year old or whatever it was, you know, that was that was all good fun. Uh, so, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I really like uh, Superman and, uh, you know, and, and have enjoyed a lot of, of Superman comics, TV shows, movies, you know, the whole whole range yeah my introduction to him would have been the i think it's 97 uh superman the animated series cartoon and i grew up in that batman you know spider-man x-men all the times those 90s cartoons were kind of what really got me into comics to begin with and it it helps a lot my dad is also a huge collector and has been ever since he was a kid so he would at the time he was a high school teacher uh, and he had his comics there because there wasn't a space to store him at home. So he, he had an entire, uh, what was supposed to be a locker room filled with just his uh, long boards and everything. So whenever I was with him for while he was coaching or what have you, I'd be in there like reading the you know, Marvel team up and action comics and everything. So that's how I got into that. And actually we just recently were at a comic shop. We were visiting my brother, sister and niece in Chicago. And I wish I could remember the name of it. It was a really nice shop. Uh, and bought a lot of action comics and Superman from like the 70s. And just to fill the spots in the list, felt really good. So yeah, this show 
I really enjoy its take on Superman. Uh, as someone, people, people have kind of accused me on the show of being like, uh, uh, what, what word they used? It was like, not hope. I don't know. Uh, uh, just an idealist about hope and stuff like that. And Superman is one of those properties that like, that's kind of the core premise. Right. It's like, if you're supposed to feel, okay, everything's going to be okay. And this show makes me feel that even when like, yeah, yeah, he, get not, he gets knocked around by a supervillain or, you know, Amanda Waller does what she does and causes turmoil and, you know, anti-alien trust. And like, yeah, as, at the end of the day, I feel like he's got it. So I really appreciate that aspect of his character. Is it, what, what about him kind of draws you to Superman as a character? Yeah, I think that the aspirational nature of Superman, uh, the, the hope that he inspires, that his, you know, understanding that, to, you know, I mean, he, he was kind of the with great power comes great responsibility character before uh, <laughs> Spider-Man. Right? I, I don't know that it was ever articulated in those words, but he certainly has that same ethos of, well, I, I can do yeah. these things. And so I have to use it uh, well, use it to benefit other people, not just myself. Uh, and yeah, I, I think those are all good values to, to aspire to, even if they're, you know, we can't be as perfect at it as a, a fictional character. <laughs> I think that's kind of the point of him is that he's supposed to be the best of us and yet mm -hmm. also alien at the same time. But but because he was raised human, it's kind of like the war from Star Trek. It's like the idealized Klingon. Superman is like the idealized human being. It's like, yeah, there's plenty of problems with actual Klingons. There's plenty of prob problems with actual humans, but they strive to be what the culture says we're supposed to be like. And I like that a lot about a character who chooses to be that way, even though Obviously, he's Kryptonian. Obviously, he's he could, if he wanted to, take over the entire world. But that's not Clark. That's not Mon Pa Kent's boy. And part of this show, as you've seen in some of these episodes, is, of course, Amanda Waller being Amanda Waller. And part of her is that legitimate fear of there is this entity out there we can't control, we don't know the name of, who just showed up one day, is super powerful. He could turn on us at any time. So why are we working measures against it? So do you think that she has a point about unknown factors like superheroes and aliens? You know, it, it is one of those challenging things to, to kind of wrestle with because, of course, it's all made up. Uh, but, but yes, you can see, <laughs> right, you can see the point uh, in, in some of these things, right? The, in X-Men comics, it's the Sentinels and, and all that program. Uh, you know, Superman yes. has the same kind of thing. But there's always that element of, well, yeah, if, if these people really existed, we would have reason to be a little bit worried that they can do uh, do things to us that are, you know, we have no no recourse for, uh, you know. And, and there are stories, you know, like uh, Chronicle or, or Brightburn or whatever that, that kind of push that direction of, you know, what if what if the guardrails are, are taken off? What if the character doesn't have the same morals, the same ethos as a Superman or a Batman? Um, so yeah, it's. Within the context of the, the story, you can see where somebody like Amanda Waller and even even sometimes where Lex Luthor is coming from with that perspective. Of, yes. Hey, you know, what do we what do we do in case this doesn't go well? Or what if, you know, yes, Superman, maybe we trust Superman, but he's not the only one out there. And, you know, he can't be everywhere at all times. And, and uh, we can't always rely on him. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's there's something there, but it is hard to know how exactly to map that uh to to the real world when there's a you know there are certainly asymmetrical situations in the real world but not necessarily uh at the same level or maybe it's just you know i have the privilege of being in a, in a society where if there is asymmetry it's mostly in the other direction yeah. yeah it's an easy question to answer from the comic side of thing for the most part but like real world yeah you kind of go you know if a professor x exists out there and he can mentally manipulate anyone at any point of time of his choosing or a gene gray or madeline Pryor, or uh, the plenty of other telepaths that are in just the x-men alone don't you think maybe we should i don't know make sure they're not using that power for evil like is would a mutant registration act would a superhero registration act be what should actually happen you know the idealist in me when it goes no like we got to trust our heroes they're looking after us but i also live in the world and i know not everyone is doing this for pure intention so if this were actually real as much as i hate myself for saying it i would be behind like a registration kind of system so we know okay you're capable of doing this uh we've got these systems in place to make sure that power isn't abused but also without like going full uh 
Apocalypse or full Sentinel or full Lex Luthor on anyone where you are now afraid to use your abilities because we're afraid of you. So, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of where I stand. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I would probably lean a little bit in the other direction of, uh, you know, I don't know about like registration acts. I, th I think that there's an important distinction to be made between legislating behavior and legislating uh, ability or identity, right? That we don't want to make it illegal to be who you are, uh, but we do want to yes. make it illegal to do certain things, especially do certain things to other people. Uh, and so, yeah, that is a, you know, that is a difficult line to draw in the case of a, of a telepath, right? How do you even... How do you police that? How do you even know what's going on? And how do you uh, provide a reasonable deterrent as opposed to uh, you know, having to, to deal with the after effects, right? Because uh, some of these characters can do things that, well, by the time you, by the time they're done, right, it, it, there's, there is no coming back. There is nothing you can do after the fact. And so I can understand the, the impulse towards prevention. Uh, but I, I do think even if it means we have to live with some risk, right, we, we want to, we want to not get, go down that road of, uh, legislating against uh, what people can uh, are able to do or, or what people who people are and kind of registering people in a way that that also you know creates opportunities for exploiting uh, or uh, persecuting those folks yeah I think one of the best ones that ever handled this was actually the Justice League cartoon where we get to see like the Justice Lords in con controlling an entire world. And then we have Amanda Waller learning that information and then creating, you know, Task Force X and everything and being like as a deterrent. And then the superhero is also kind of going, you know, it. I get why they're afraid because of what we're capable of. Now, we need to learn from that and be better. And I think at the end of the day, that was handled extremely well. I don't, did you ever watch those? Not enough to get a, a, a sense of that kind of uh, scale of, of storytelling. That's fair. You know, there's only so much time in the world. We can't watch and read everything. Yeah. So <laughs> it's hard as a geek sometimes. It's like, especially with like the two of the topics that you're bringing up. Like, I, in fact, we can go ahead and transfer that way after uh, a rate and review. Uh, I give my adventures of Superman a nine out of 10. I really love this show. I'm ready to see more of what they have. But let's go to the three body problem. Andy, could you explain this to the audience? Sure. It is a tough one to talk about because there is <laughs> lots that can be spoiled. Uh, and I, I don't want to give away everything, but I also want to be able to talk about it a little bit. And so that means talking about some things. Uh, it is the, the thing that I think is most interesting, especially relevant to this conversation is that is it essentially, it's essentially a story in which, uh, something like the My Adventures of Superman plot or the plot of uh, Man of Steel film, if, if that were to happen, but without Superman living among us, right? So there is only this alien threat, but without that element of, well, we have somebody on our side or, or we have somebody who might be on our side. Right? There is just this sort of uh, looming aliens that can that have superior abilities and technology. Um, and, you know, so, so the protagonists of the show are basically the Amanda Wallers of, of this world, right? <laughs> they, they are tasked with how do we, how do we defend against this uh, threat of alien invasion, alien uh, incursion, and you know what? What lines are we willing to cross? Are there any? You know, should we draw any lines, or is it everything on the table when there's this ex existential threat of this level? Uh, and so that's one of the you know one of the central uh, through through lines, the central storylines of the show, perhaps arguably the, the central storyline. Um, and the the interesting wrinkle is that it there's a long term aspect of it, and, and something that I, I really appreciate about the show is that it it deals in a little bit in the physical reality of uh, light light speed travel and the uh, impossibility of such things so these aliens are coming at us but but only <laughs> at one percent of light speed so we have we have a couple hundred year horizon uh, before to figure things out and I, I like the ambition of that kind of storytelling because it, it introduces problems that you don't have in other kinds of stories of just how do you plan for something that far in advance? How do you ensure that things stay on track when it's going to exceed the lifetime of any person who starts those plans? Uh, and that, you know, so there, there's some ambition there. There's some interesting, uh, wrinkles and I, there are some interesting solutions to that, that I won't, I won't spoil too much. Uh, but yeah, I, I like, I, that was, that was what I found the most interesting, uh, part about it. Uh, I was less interested in it's, it's a very overtly theological show in that. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of talk about, uh, well, you know, because we have all this scientific knowledge, we've 
you know, we scientists don't have to believe in God anymore, but now what do, what do we do when we, we encounter these essentially omniscient and uh, all-powerful aliens? Uh, you know, are they, should we think of them as gods? You know, there, there's a whole cult that has grown up around uh, essentially worshiping these aliens or welcome these aliens as, as potential saviors to the point that they even address them as our Lord or my Lord. Uh, you know, so it's very overtly religious and very overtly, you know, cult-like in, in its depiction. I'm not sure that there's anything interesting to say there, but it certainly is uh, kind of poking at the, the typical, uh, you know, atheism, you know, science, is, science drives people to atheism kind of uh, angle. Um, so, you know, I, I think it was worthwhile to, to engage with just kind of being aware that, you know, that it's something kind of overtly in that space, uh, but I'm not sure it had anything new to, new to say about that. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll pause there and see if you have any kind of reactions or, or questions. If you'd like to support our show, please consider joining our Patreon, where you get live access to our YouTube exclusive, including our comic book ketchup, manga mustard, drinks with teachers, and our companion series that we do each year with our annual theme. You can also get exclusive merch, including t-shirts, handbags, a coffee mug, and a long sleeve shirt. We also have available bonus extra questions at the end of most of our podcast episodes. You get access to exclusive Discord channels, discounts on our store, access to any future online D&D campaigns. You get to vote on topics for some of our episodes. You can easily access all of the Patreon content right through Spotify now. So super easy. Go to our Spotify page at the top. It's going to say exclusive content for subscribers. If you're a patron, hit that button. You get all of our bonus content right there on Spotify, right with your regular feed. And of course, you get the satisfaction of knowing you helped a podcast in need. Our overhead includes editing software, marketing equipment, recording software, and a a lot more. And there's a lot that goes into keeping the lights on here. And we really appreciate all of our patron subscribers for helping the show happen. No, no. Yeah, sure. Um, So it's my understanding these are based on Chinese novels, correct? Yeah, so there's a series of three novels uh, that uh, have been translated uh, from Chinese, yes. Okay. Now, does this take place over, you said that we have like 100 plus years to uh, prepare. Does the novel, would the show take place over that amount of time? Do we have characters die off because of stuff like that? Do we just transition, time skip kind of thing? Or is that like a huge spoiler? Right. So, um. This is the first, uh, you know, this seems to be adapting. I haven't read the books. So I, okay. you know, people, there, there's a lot to spoil, like I said, in these stories, which meant that when, when people talked about the book, they were pretty vague. And so I never really kind of got a sense of what is this book about? And would it be something that I would like? And so I never got around to reading it. Uh, but I decided to give, <laughs> everybody was talking about the TV show. And so I like, decided to give that a try. And now I kind of get like, oh, okay, I see what was interesting about this, but I also see why nobody wanted to say anything about what it, what it was really about. Um, gotcha. so I, th- I believe over the course of three books, uh, that time horizon, uh, of several hundred years will come into play. I, I think it's okay to say that, uh, that the full extent of that time horizon is not explored in the first season, which I, which seems to be adapting the first of those three books. Um, but they're definitely, we, we can, okay. They're definitely setting up go, go the ahead. issues, uh, that that presents, but it doesn't explore that whole timeline in the, in the first season. Okay. Now, have we been confirmed for a season two? They have. Yes. If you go on Netflix now, it, you know, it proudly proclaims that it's been renewed. And I believe the plan is that they've Perfect. just already gone and ca- had and committed to two more seasons so that they'll finish the story as written in the books. Oh, even better. I love those guarantees. OK, so since this is written from a Chinese perspective, uh, uh, you haven't read the book, so maybe I can't ask that question that way. And do you know if there was any like you know, race lifting for like a, a more wider American audience that was done, that they change characters to different nationalities or something like that? Right. I mean, there, there are definitely plenty of uh, Chinese national characters in the TV show. Um, it is my understanding that there's one character who was basically split into five characters uh, for the TV show. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's definitely some changes or, or additions of race and gender there. Uh, and, and role. Um, and I think that that was done, uh, for a couple of different reasons. Partly, you know, partly I think it does help to make the cast of the show more international, not just more American friendly, but more, uh, friendly to anybody uh, outside of, of China. Um, but there is still definitely a strong, uh, Chinese angle to the story. There are definitely, you know, Chinese, uh, characters, 
who play significant roles. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I can't say for sure, you know, that it was all handled well or, or that it doesn't take away from the book, but it, it certainly isn't completely, uh, removed from its origins. Okay. Well, while we're on the subject, like, is that something that irks you? Like it does me, like whenever someone, uh, a gender is changed or a race is changed from one thing to another, whether I don't care what the race is or what the gender is, when a character is established in a source material as this, and you're trying to adapt that thing to film or television or animation or what have you, and then they just change it without saying like, hey, we're reimagining things. Like, that's kind of like the the outward for me is like you say reimagining, I go, okay, well, it'll have to be the same. They're doing their own thing. Like, I don't know. I asked like 50 different questions. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Parse my stupidity. Um, you know, I, th I think it's one of those things that, that can be done well and can be done poorly. Uh, I, I okay. don't think I, I have a, a usual kind of gut reaction to it. I think it, it depends on the situation. There, you know, except when you're adapting things, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to, uh, to make those kinds of changes. Uh, or, you know, the, the very first thing that comes to mind, uh, which is a little bit different because it's not fictional, but right, the Hamilton musical, right, obviously makes some, some mm -hmm. very specific choices in casting, but there's a point to it. They're, they're making, uh, they're making comment through that choice. And, you know, I, I think there are plenty of opportunities to do that sort of thing and, and to do it well. And, but sometimes it's done just to kind of, you know, sat tick a box or satisfy some, uh, whatever. And then maybe, it, you know, it, it, it may not be done so well or it may not have much of a point. And that in those cases, it might stick out a little bit more. Well, I think you raise an excellent point when you bring up theater, like, especially something like that or voice acting. You typically go uh, talent over appearance, mostly because, I mean, in most theatrical productions, you don't have everything you need. You have a select group of people who are qualified to do this, but then it may not meet certain like looks or uh, genders or something like that, because you just have that select group. Same thing with voice acting. Like not everyone who voices, you know, Japanese characters in anime is going to be Japanese because they're probably going to be white because that's what they had around that time. So I'm a little more okay with something like that because when you only have a small pool, you know, to fish out of, that's what you kind of have to deal with. Now, acting, I kind of get a little more upset about sometimes, sometimes a little too much for my own good, because you have a wider net to throw out. But oh, I don't know. We we don't need to keep focusing on this. So uh, my last question, I swear, and we can move on. What is the titular three body problem? I know this is some is a scientific uh, idea about planets at some point in time. I think from what I had researched earlier, could, were you able to explain it all or have they explained it at all? That, yes, it is very clear why the show is called Three Body Problem uh, but once in the book, once you get into it. Um, so the, you know, the, the classic thing from uh, physics that if you have two uh, objects, like two suns, two stars uh, orbiting each other, you can, you can write differential equations and solve them analytically to figure out where they're going to be at any point in time. If you introduce uh. a third body, a third star, uh, then while you can, there are plenty of mathematical tools that you can use to make predictions, there's no analytical solution that will tell you precisely in all circumstances where those uh, objects are going to be in the future. Um, and so the aliens uh, who represent this existential threat come from a solar system that has three, three stars that the planet that they live on orbits. And that creates very unpredictable dynamics for like seasons and, and things like that. And so, uh, it's created conditions for the, these aliens that they have a very different culture and background be, because of the very different, uh, kind of world that they live in and it's a very different experience that they, that their society, uh, developed in. Uh, and there, there's some drama that's, that's created out of that. Uh, but. Yeah, so so it's it's about the, the you know the title refers to the, their solar system and the, the challenges in predicting uh, three bodies. Now, my my first reaction was, well, hang on, it's three stars and, and a planet. Uh, isn't that a four body problem? But uh, I was told that because the planet uh, doesn't really affect the orbits of, or the motions of the three stars, that it's still most physicists would still consider that a three body problem. Okay, yeah, there's very huge difference in size. Right. All right. Well, before we transition to the next topic, how would you rate and review 
uh, this first season of Three Body Problem? Yeah, I think I would personally give it something like a 7 out of 10. It got uh, pretty gory and gruesome at times, more than I was expecting and more than I would have cared for. Um, if uh, some other people might rate it higher because they're not quite as bothered by that. Um, and also, you know, a little bit uh, bothered by the all scientists or, you know, non-believers and all that that kind of thing, which may, I'm, <laughs> I may be being a little bit unfair, but it definitely leaned into the stereotypes more than, than it interrogated with, with nuance. Uh, so, yeah, I, it, you know, it's but an easy trope. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there was also still plenty of, of big, cool ideas uh, that I appreciated about it. So, yeah, seven out of ten. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, next up on our docket, we have House of the Dragon season two. We are continuing uh, from the first season where Rhaenyra, who is supposed to be appointed by her father as the first official queen of the Seven Kingdoms in a male-dominated society, is being challenged by her now, goodness gracious, these royal things, a mother-in-law who was her friend of the same age, pr practically, who has had children with Rhaenyra's father, who would now also have a claim to the throne. And now we are between Team Black, which is Rhaenyra's side, and Team Green, which is Alicent's side. Uh, Andy, have you watched Game of Thrones or House of Dragon at all? Yeah, my wife got into the Game of Thrones books. And so we would dip in and out of the show uh, when when HBO was a free uh, add-on to our, our cable <laughs> subscription at the time. Every once in a while, they'd, they'd throw us a free a nice. month or two. And we binge a few episodes just to kind of catch up on what was going on. Um, and, and actually, my, you know, the part that I was most interested in, in Game of Thrones was that similar sort of how do you deal with an existential threat that looms over across many generations? Uh, and how does that impact all these other uh, political uh, squabbles and, and you know, uh, throne drama uh, that's going on around it? And how do people kind of rally beyond that to, to deal with this bigger existential threat? I thought was an interesting theme. Uh, we did watch. Uh, House of Dragon season one. And I, I frankly personally missed that element. I was like, Oh, this is all the things that I wasn't all that interested in the, the soap opera, uh, you know, royal drama, uh, without any of the sort of opportunity for heroism and, and uniting people around a common cause and all that kind of thing. Um, obviously it's well yeah. done for, you know, for what it is and, and, you know, hard to complain too much about the show with dragons. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, I, I personally would have, you know, missed that aspect of the of the sort of Game of Thrones world. Yeah, as of this recording, we're three episodes in a season two. Uh, I know a little of what's going to happen later on. I'm very interested to see where things go. But what has kind of always been, I've always kind of had that nagging in the back of my head when it comes to Martin's work here, is kind of a hopelessness in his series of like, well, people are just going to be people. And no matter how stable you make things, people are going to break down. And like, yeah, I can kind of get behind some of that because I also live in this world. But it, it just it just seems like a bullying kind of way of like, if you don't think the same way I do at times, you know, you're too naive or anything to get anything done. And kind of one of the things I want to ask you is when we have all these incredibly difficult situations here where both people in their own ways, have legitimate claims to this throne. And yet it causes a war to break out. It causes houses to be divided. How are we supposed to navigate these difficult situations in a God-honoring fashion, They're ignoring the show itself, but like in our own life? Like, how are we supposed to do that in a world like this? Yeah, that, that, you know, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, I think, um, I think trying, you know, trying to, Find a way to to maximize the opportunities for for everyone, right? I, I, something that uh, you know, I, I think Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon have done at times, but could maybe do more of is the you know how does this affect everybody else, right? Where there's all of this royal family drama, but most people aren't a member of any of these families and, and don't really care. Um, yes, uh, you know, I I did uh, try to catch up a little bit on on the season three. Uh, season two, rather, the three episodes of season two, uh, just to be able to, to chat a little bit. Uh, and I did like the bit uh, where, uh, and I apologize because I, I can't, they all have the same name or practically the same name. And I can't quite <laughs> keep everybody straight. But you are perfectly fine. This is a safe place. Matt Matt Smith shows up to uh, to the one <laughs> castle uh, and they're just kind of like, okay, fine. You're, you're, you're the boss now. Would you like some dinner? Like we have, we're not really into this whole like 
squabbling and picking sides. Like we'll we'll just we're here to get along. We're here to live our daily lives and get get food on the table and hang out with each other and you know all this kind of stuff. And it's I I, I like that uh, little moment. Um, and yeah, I, I think I yes. more of that of just like remembering that uh, you know it's back to the Superman thing. Remembering that this power is to be to the benefit of other people, not just to to enrich or uh, satisfy the the whims of the few in power. Yeah, I mean it's hard to you know, throw Christ into a situation like this in a world where he's not there and uh, intentionally not put there, even though we have. Uh, if you'll look at our Game of Thrones religions episodes we did previously on systematic ecology, there is a seven in one situation instead of a three in one for like the Church of the Seven. So you can kind of put it in there. It's not the same exactly, but the the idea of how can we be people seeking after Christ in a world where everyone just seems to not care? And that's an easy accusation to throw against our own world. And even this world here for Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. So what, what am I supposed to do with that? What, how do I not just feel like, well, there's no point, you know, Jesus is going to come back either way. What, what is my role here? Well, I mean, just by looking what people have done. And that's why we look back on scripture and we see things like, you know, uh, Esther rising above her current situation to save people in a way that no one else was possible or was capable of doing, of Jesus himself being in another impossible situation and yet still being the man God who would die for our sins, for people who were murdering him right there. Uh, it doesn't matter the time and place, like it would have happened regardless. And that's what I'm called. Oh, that was a nice little thunder over there. Don't know if that caught, caught on the mic. Uh, if I am called to do that same thing, I'm called to serve God and not man. Like, how is that possible? Well, I, I need to be in scripture. I need to be in a community with people who are pushing me towards that same thing to having that same goal. And it's a lot harder to do if I'm by myself, which is where I tend to do things. I'm, I have to continually learn the lesson of lone wolf Christian is never a thing, has never been a thing and will never be a thing. So I, I think uh, one thing I would call myself and other people out would be don't leave this world behind. It's easier to do that, but it's a lot harder to stay in it, to be talking to people. I mean, just using our, our current political climate in America as the perfect example. And you guys can also check out the whole church episode that just released on how the church, should the church be bipartisan or not, uh, that just dropped today. And then how can I reach out to that person who thinks differently than me? And yet I can still respect them. I can still love them. And even if it's only one-sided on my part, I'm still doing my job. So I guess my answer would be just, just be Jesus. But at the end of the day, you need a little more than that to bolster that idea what do you think andy i'm rambling yeah i mean you know certainly be christ-like is, is hard to argue against uh <laughs> uh easier said than done you know there's certainly you know the looking yes. for right looking for the ways who, who can i help uh who even if it if it seems small in the, in the grand scale of things right that's that's all most of us can do right very few of us uh have a dragon and can raise a whole city in defense of something or whatever, right? But we can we can do small things. We can share food. We can share shelter. We can share encouragement. Um, and I think you know yes. the other thing is uh, to yes, be Christ-like, uh, but also remember that one of the things he encourages us to do is be childlike, right? Keep that sort of uh, that hope, that innocence, that sort of uh, not not exactly naive, but uh, you know, not hardening ourselves or, or being too cynical either about uh, the world. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know. The Game of Thrones world doesn't have a lot of uh, great examples of that because they put so many of the children in positions where they have to be just as uh, cynical and, and hardened as the adults because they, they have to be the adults in, in a lot of situations, uh, or at least the children that, that get you know promoted uh, to prominence in the story. Um, but still, I, you know, I think there's there's an element uh, there as well to remember that maybe you know on some days it might be easier to keep that in mind uh, because it's a little bit more. Uh, tangible, we can we can see more concrete examples of, of childlikeness around us. I think you raise an excellent point. Uh, being childlike versus childish, you know, it's easy to be childish. It's easy to throw your hands up and say nothing matters, everything sucks, and 
then I can do whatever I want. It's far more difficult to be childlike in that fashion of here's how things are supposed to be. Here's what I'm supposed to do. Like I'm supposed to follow the rules. I'm supposed to love people like Jesus loved me. And yeah, that's that's easier to say, but it's a lot harder to actually enact in the world. And that's what makes it worth doing. It doesn't always feel like that, but it's what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else you want to say on House of Dragon before we move on? Uh, no, I think that covers it. Okay. Uh, I will also rate this. Um, no, I'll give this a 9.5. Uh, as depressing as uh, Martin's works can be at times, I am still in it to win it with this one. Um, I'm ready to see more. Uh, I'm actually, I'm still ready to see Creek and Stark come in. I want to see my Starks. I'm hoping this season we see them more. So there's that. And as we move on to our next topic, or Sweet Tooth, the final season, uh, season three, uh, was released last month. So Andy, take it away. Yeah. So uh, I I actually didn't do this on purpose, believe it or not. But uh, that that childlike uh, quality is definitely a big part of the story of Sweet Tooth. Right. It is another one of these you know sort of existential threat stories, and a big part of the the theme is that. Uh, you know, we need to, to retain some of that uh, childlike, uh, again, not naivete, but uh, lack of cynicism, right? Uh, that uh, uh -huh. believing, you know, believing in uh, the best of people or, or you know, taking people that, uh, that, that they're going to be good faith actors and being a good faith actor yourself. Um, so anyway, uh, more specifically, what is Sweet Tooth about? Right? So it, it's a world uh, more or less present day uh, where a... Uh, a, a pandemic has occurred, right? And, and the first season of this show, I believe, was was filmed before the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but then finished during it and, and released during it. Uh, and so that was a very interesting uh, experience because they clearly uh, had had made some some tweaks to it to more visually reflect the reality of, of living with a uh, contagious disease. Uh, I think I think there was more masking in the in the first season than it originally originally filmed, if I understand correctly. Um, and so yeah, so there, there's this uh, this deadly pandemic that is uh, going around the world, but there's also this uh, unusual phenomenon of children being born uh, with some animal-like features. Uh, so the main character there, uh, who is called Sweet Tooth because he loves to drink uh, maple syrup just straight, uh, um, he. Uh, he has some some deer-like features, right? So he has deer antlers and, and deer ears, uh, and you know, the, pretty much every, every kid is is different. There's uh, you know wolves and and bears and porcupines and birds, you know, different kinds of birds, eagles, and and I, I don't you know remember the whole uh, menagerie, but uh, you know each each kid is kind of its own uh, unique hybrid, and so you know the the overall story is figuring out that yes these two things are are connected and is there a way to stop the pandemic and is there a way to stop the pandemic that doesn't doesn't also endanger these hybrid children uh and so uh, okay um you know the first two seasons were a lot of kind of uncovering that mystery figuring out what you know what had gone on what was connected to what uh learning the, the history of, of this character and then he, you know he has the very typical like he grows up in a, in a sheltered situation with just his dad. And then uh, something happened. There's an inciting incident and he has to go out into the wider world and meet different, he you know, meets different characters along the way. And, uh, you know, has a, has a, you know, strong sort of odyssey flavor to it. I'm not sure that things map exactly to the specific, uh, dangers of the odyssey, like, like, oh, brother, we're uh, trying to do, but it definitely has that. It's that kind of a story yes. of, you know, hero goes on a journey, uh, to, uh, uh, and you know, has to has to deal with various sort of episodic dangers along the way. Uh, and so the, you okay. know, this final season is about kind of bringing that main story to a conclusion of and answering those questions of is there something that can be done about the pandemic and what what will it mean for the future of both the non hybrid people and and these hybrid children. And I won't spoil how it ends, um, but you know the main character is uh, a child and it is. Uh, you know, a family-ish show, definitely not for little kids, but it, you know, it is definitely, uh, meant to draw in a, a family audience. So you can maybe guess, uh, that it's not all doom and gloom, uh, but I won't, I won't get into all the particulars. Um, you know, this is something that, that my family, uh, and I watched, uh, together. Um, so that was, 
that was a positive thing about it. Uh, we enjoyed kind of getting into the characters. There, you know, there are definitely aspects of the science. My, you know, my my day job is in public health. My my educational background is in infectious disease biology. So there were definitely moments where where I winced, and definitely moments where I was like, okay, no, that's actually that's actually a good uh, thing. There there was a moment uh, in this in this season where the a bunch of characters were together and kind of celebrating, and I was like, I'm not sure that this is such a good idea. And then like. That, you know, the very next scene is, oh yes, it was, I was right. It was not a good idea. My my concerns were were in fact well founded. Uh, so yeah, that you know that was that was definitely an interesting uh, whole aspect of the show given my uh, professional background. Um, you know, the the hybrid biology is a little bit harder to to swallow, is exactly. But you know, it's definitely more of a, of a fantasy uh, kind of magical realism. to sort of you just kind of have to go with it. Um, okay, yeah, I was about to ask, is it? more mystical in that sense or is it just like the this is like the one big lie in the series is that this is capable of happening just accept it yeah it, it while it does get into a lot of you know how how did this come to happen and and all there is definitely no expl- no further explanation than just uh these these kids are being born this way we we don't can't explain how uh in in any sort of biological terms uh it's happening or uh, or what it means or what it, anything like that. So yeah, you do just kind of have to accept that this is a world in which this, this works this way. Okay. And this was based off a comic, is it not? Yeah. It's a, it's a Jeff Lemire, uh, comic. So he wrote and drew it. Um, he has a very, uh, you know, he works in like watercolors or whatever. He probably, if, you know, if you've been around, uh, comics in the, you know, the past decade or so, you've probably seen the, the cover image from one of the early issues of a boy with deer antlers. Um, was you know got pretty widely circulated. It's, it's a very striking image and, and it raised a lot of questions of what exactly is this book about? Um, yeah, you know, and, and it was a it was a well regarded uh, comic series, and you know, I, and I think it's it's been fairly successfully adapted uh, as a as a show. So, how would you feel about rating the entirety show, or the entire show, or just season three? Which one do you want to choose? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're more or less uh, in the same same ballpark. Uh, you know, that they all felt. Uh, of a piece, um, I, I would probably give it, uh, you know, an eight out of ten uh, overall. You know, there may be some. There, there's a part of me that, that wants to rate some of it uh, a little bit lower, just so that you know, that scientist uh, nitpicker in me. Um, <laughs> but you know, in terms of in terms of uh, it, you know, I think it's very well done in terms of developing its themes, and it, you know, it, there are definitely positive messages about uh, you know, working together, working for the benefit of others, all those kinds of things that we've been talking about. Um, how do you how do you embrace somebody who is different from you? Uh, how, how do you how do you relate to somebody who is different different from you? Uh, those are those are all good themes, okay. and, I, and I think it it does well. Yeah, again, you know, maybe a little bit more uh, younger, you know, pitch for a younger audience uh, than uh, you know c- uh, cynical adults. Uh, but there's definitely things for adults to to get out of it, and you know, if nothing else, we need those reminders from time to time. Perfect. Yeah, it sounds like a really fun, whimsical show. I, I, your entire family watched it. How old are your kids? You might is that something you want to share? If not, don't worry about it. it it's fine. They they are now uh, nearly adults themselves. My my son is eighteen and starting college in the fall, and my daughter is uh, seventeen. Uh, so they were you know a little bit younger. Okay. Um, I I don't know if, if it for, if the first season came out now if they would be as interested in it. Um, but you know four years ago it was kind of <laughs> right. It, it hit them I think right about exactly uh, at the right level, and so then they were just kind of. Uh, hooked on it okay perfect well andy thank you for joining me tonight for what's new episode this was a lot of fun Uh, i enjoyed learning i enjoyed hearing what you had to say so as far as these four series are concerned or even something we mentioned in the lightning round what would you say is your top recommendation for the audience to check out yeah i mean i I think uh i think probably and i haven't watched all of it but i think probably my adventures of superman has the has the broadest appeal and, and the easiest thing to sort of uh, wholeheartedly recommend uh, you know all the other things that you know have uh, some adult elements that your mileage may vary how much you want to, to stomach those kinds of things even even sweet tooth uh, it definitely yeah. goes to some dark places and, and has some heavy issues um, so yeah I, I think I think the easiest thing to just say yeah this is this is worth your time and you would enjoy is uh, is a Superman cartoon yeah I agree that has the wider appeal I think what I would personally recommend is something I haven't watched because it's appealing to me is actually the three body problem because that sounds extremely fascinating uh, having to deal with repercussions. We know alien life is here. It's heading our way. What do we do with that information? 
sounds a lot of fun. And I mentioned check this out forever ago when it released, but I forgot. So I'll definitely be adding that to my list of things to watch later on. So guys, uh, thank you for listening today. We cannot do this without you. We really appreciate your support. Uh, please leave a like and subscribe below if you're on YouTube. If you don't do that, you break Will's heart and Will has suffered enough. We can't let that that poor heart suffer any more harm. So please just leave him a like and subscribe. Now, if you're on the podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice to help the ratings there to find more people so we can keep spreading the joy that is systematic ecology to you. As well, since you guys have got us to 100 subscribers on YouTube, we are going to be doing a special Q&A session at a later date to be determined where we will answer your questions. It could be anything that you send our way. We will compile a list and as many hosts as possible will join in and we'll try to get the hosts who aren't on to get their answers as well if you have a specific question for a specific host. And we just want to reward you guys with a Q&A session that you can just ask us literally anything. As well, I do want to thank some people who helped sponsor our show. A thank you to Ethan Overcash, Austin Nance, and Amber Riley. But most importantly, remember, we are all the chosen people, a geekdom of freedom. Make sure you follow us on Instagram. Catch us live at events we are holding or attending. Get updates when we post new episodes of the podcast. See our other favorite content that we lift up and support, as well as just see our beautiful faces and engage with us through messages. Maybe watch your reel and give us the feedback of what you think of the show. Hello, friends. If you like Systematic Ecology, then there's a host of other podcasts in our network that we think you will like just as much. And so we're part of the Anazal Ministry Podcast Network, and we hope that you can hop over and subscribe uh, with all the podcasts that are in our network. Like, for instance, the homily, which is, hey, Pastor Will Rose's sermon here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. You have another podcast called The Whole Church Podcast, the OG, the originals, the beginner of it all. Yes, Joshua Noel and TJ working for unity among the church and having great conversations with the wide spectrum of those who are involved in Christian ministry and the church. You have My Seminary Life uh, by Brandon Knight, who's discussing what he's learning in seminary, what's he is learning his theological studies and, and bringing to the surface uh, those big things that we're wrestling with and thinking through theologically in the church and beyond. There's the Let Nothing Move You podcast from Christian Ashley, who is walking through the Bible in a very Bible study type fashion and walking through the biblical narrative. You have Dummy for Theology. I don't think Joshua is a dummy, but hey, he's going to lift up theological themes that he's thinking about and wrestling with. And maybe there's not a lot of um, answers, but there's definitely a lot of great questions out there that he's lifting up with some great theologians across the whole spectrum of Christianity. And then there's the Bible After Hours. Man, if you like to get risky, if you like to get controversial, there's this foul-mouthed preacher who goes from goes through the Bible from a more progressive point of view, challenging the status quo of the modern church. Yeah, yeah, you don't want any kids around with, with that podcast. And then you have the Clydes, uh, one of my favorite couples uh, that I like to listen to. One of the hosts here on Systematic Ecology, Taylor and Elizabeth Clyde, go through weekly discussions and kind of a devotional, conversational method of, of what's going on in their lives, uh, where they see God moving in their lives, and what God is up to in the world. So those are the podcasts a part of the AMP Network. Subscribe, follow, we hope you can be a part of all that great network with the wonderful podcasts at AMP.